Seagrass is form an ancient and magical underwater garden as old as the dinosaurs. These submerged flowering plants evolved from land plants about 100 million years ago when dinosaurs roamed the earth and they've adapted to sea life. You're looking at actually a terrestrial plant that has been able to make the transition to a marine environment and do much of what it did on land in the water. In other words, it's able to flower and reproduce and produce male and female gametes that fertilize each other in the water. It's able to reproduce asexually, in other words, it's able, or to bud, to clone itself. So there's both asexual and sexual means of reproduction, as you would find in many plants on land. Although there are only 60 species of seagrasses worldwide, they have colonized all but the most polar seas. In the Caribbean, seagrasses are often found growing between beaches and reefs, and they often form extensive meadows and more protected bays and estuaries. Seagrasses differ from seaweed because they are plants with vessels, or internal water transportation systems, and well-defined root and shoot systems. We have four species of seagrasses in Trinidad and Tobago. Thalassia testudinum, which is the common turtle grass. Halophilia discipiens. Halodule wrightii. And syringodium filiformi. The latter is only found in Tobago. This is Thalassia testudinum, otherwise known as turtle grass. But a seagrass bed is very rich and healthy. It's an indication of the water quality. Their colonization of the seabed over time required a number of key adaptations, including blade-shaped leaves fit for a high-energy environment with lots of currents and waves, hydrophilus pollination, allowing the plants to be pollinated underwater, and extensive lacuna systems or bodily cavities which allow internal gas flow. These seagrasses they are found in areas depending on the conditions. So for example, the turtle grass, they're usually found in shallow, shallow areas offshore. You find the um, syringodium, which is the manatee grass, it is found in areas which are closer to shore and which you will have fresh water coming out. And some of those grasses actually can grow in fresh water and you will find them on land as well as in the that area where fresh water is mixing with, with seawater. You also have some of them occurring there. Seagrasses help to sustain human life in a variety of ways. Over a billion people live within 30 miles of a seagrass meadow. Millions of people obtain their protein from animals that live in seagrasses. The grasses have been used by humans for over 10,000 years. A lot of the seagrass is used in furniture. You know, for instance, to stuff cushions and, and make beds. So it's not just a, a fishery thing, it's not just a coastline thing, but it's, it's right throughout the fabric of your coastal population. Tropical seagrasses in the Caribbean are among the most productive in the world. It's very important in terms of productivity. Uh, the same function on land where plants during the day photosynthesize and produce oxygen, um, produce biomass, and export this biomass to other ecosystems to be consumed by other animals and plants because of the breakdown of nutrients. Same thing happens in the water. So that you have a lot of reef fish, for instance, that come in to prey on other species that as juveniles are found only in seagrass beds or in nearby mangrove systems and there's this interplay of species, interdependence of species. The seagrasses are very important nursery habitats, so they actually support the overall fishery that's associated with the coastal environments. This productivity, of course, is reflected in the extensive fishery resources that's associated with coastal environments where they're found. Um, we have fish, for example, the grunt and the snappers. We have spiny lobsters, conks. They are the primary food source for the world's largest marine herbivores, the West Indian manatee and the dugong, and are a major food source for green sea turtles. 
Although seagrasses occupy only 0.1% of the seafloor, they are responsible for 11% of the organic carbon buried in the ocean. Their role in the carbon cycle greatly aids in reducing greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. They also act as, um, they act to reduce erosion and in that they can actually slow down the movement of water, especially during episodic events like hurricanes and storms. One of the big things a seagrass bed does is that the leaves act as baffles in the water. So they slow down water movement and encourage particulate matter to settle out. So it's a good way of clearing up your, your water quality in near shore environments, removing suspended sediments from the water. This is good in terms of the water quality that a coral reef wants, because if you remember, a coral reef wants warm, clear, salty water. Clear doesn't like suspended material in the water because that blocks sunlight that's important to the reef as well. This removal of suspended sediments from the water column then builds the, the, the shoreline from the bottom up as it were and allows accretion of sediments close to shore. So it's one way of maintaining the stability of your coastline. There are a lot of other plants, in particular algae, calcareous algae, algae that have a carbonate skeleton that are associated with a seagrass bed. And when these die and break down, these skeletons are eventually what wash up on shore. And that creates the sand a significant portion of seagrasses accumulates on the beach as beach coast detritus, where they deliver carbonate materials that nourish the beach and contribute to dune formation. Although only a few feet high, dense seagrass meadows have as much leaf area as towering rainforests, which have the highest leaf areas on the planet. Seagrass meadows are more productive than fertilized cornfields. A productive seagrass meadow will fizz with oxygen bubbles looking like champagne. In June 2009, an international team of scientists warned that accelerating losses of seagrasses across the globe threatens the immediate health and long-term sustainability of coastal ecosystems. The team found that approximately 58% of the world's seagrass meadows are currently declining and estimates that seagrasses have been disappearing at the rate of around 110 square kilometers per year since 1980. They cite two primary causes for the decline, direct impact from coastal development and dredging activities, and the indirect impact of declining water quality. The tendency is once you build in the coastal zone in an irresponsible manner, it means that some of your waste material is going to be going to end up in the ocean. So in building as well, you will tend to clear mangrove swamps and the mangrove swamps act as natural filters. Now once you get pollutants going into the ocean and once you get a heavy sediment load because we, rain will naturally come and when the rain falls on the earth it's going to pick up material as it goes. Now if that material gets out into the ocean, it's going to smother the seagrass. They are plants, they photosynthesize, they depend on sunlight to live. Now if there's a heavy sediment load, lots of sediment in the water, the sunlight is not going to penetrate down to the seagrass. And without sunlight, plants cannot live. Pollutants getting into the ocean, they can have a direct toxic effect on the seagrass. Another indirect effect pollutants can have. And when I say pollutants, I don't mean necessarily the nasty chemicals. A simple thing as fertilizer that you apply to your lawn and golf courses in the coastal area, they get washed down into the ocean. Those fertilizers, they fertilize on land, they also fertilize certain things in the water. Algae will use that fertilizer and you'll get what we call a bloom, an explosion in growth in these algae. Once that explosion occurs, it will tend to block out sunlight as well. And these algae, some of them can produce toxins which actually poison everything else in the area. Seagrasses in the Caribbean face all of these threats. There's also sewage, which is an important factor. Um, also illegal sand mining increases their sediment load to the, the marine environment. All of those impact 
on the seagrasses. Now seagrasses, the government will try to protect them, protect them from development. Now coastal development, right across the Caribbean, there's a huge pressure for that because we are a tourism based society. So persons who want to make beaches, persons who want to make beachfront properties and don't want the beaches to be unfriendly to their tourists, scratching up on their feet and having organisms like stingrays and jellyfish in the seagrass. Uh, so they try to remove it. So the government, for example, in Jamaica, if you want to do such a development, you have to do serious relocation. Other things that, that happen is like development of ports. There is a lot of dredging activities, maintenance dredging of ports. Um, with that increased amount of shipping, then there is a likelihood of ships running aground, um, propeller scars also damaging the seagrass beds. All of this impact on the, the ecosystem in, in seagrasses. Other significant threats include dynamite fishing, illegal sand mining and pollution from land-based sources such as hydrocarbons, pesticides, plastics and other toxic wastes. When it comes to seagrasses, as well as all other marine ecosystems, the important thing um, about them is to protect them in however way we can. The government tries to put in laws and regulations. However, one of the most important things in tools in protecting these resources is education. So no matter what laws exist, no matter what sanctions you put against people, if you educate persons as to the importance of these ecosystems, then they're more likely to try to protect them. For example, you might see other, you might see breaches occurring across a bay like this. Now, if somebody cares and they know what shouldn't be done, then they'll be inclined to report this breach. So education in school is paramount to the success of any coastal management plan. And when it comes to seagrasses, even though they're not as attractive as coral reefs, the thing with seagrass is that there's a lot more things that you cannot see. For example, you have organisms encrusting on the blades and there are thousands of organisms there which we cannot see. And not to mention the vast amounts of carbon dioxide these plants can, um, convert to oxygen on a daily basis. It's basically comparable to the phytoplankton in the sea which makes most of our um, oxygen. The roles that it provides our management strategies have to be diverse and education as well as the local laws have to be very important in that. Information is at the center of a successful coastal zone management strategy. Each country must acquire and maintain an inventory of its coastal environments and resources. Um, in Jamaica we do mapping. Um, I, I know some other islands, I know Trinidad for example does some amount of mapping. I'm not quite sure about all the rest of the islands but it is important to do mapping to see where your resources are um, so that when development comes along you'll know where and what the potential impacts will be so it helps you to better manage um, your coastline so once you have the mapping you have that inventory especially in a GIS format so that once some development comes along then you can place it in the GIS to see what area will be dest destroyed or disturbed and, and what is the potential impact. So the Discovery Bay Marine Laboratory, in addition to the Port Royal Marine Lab, which is a part of the University of the West Indies, we have for over 50 years been very instrumental in doing research on these different coastal ecosystems. In addition to our educational programs, we do a vast amount of outreach, not only to high schools, but even when it comes to teachers' colleges, we have teachers learning to be educators in science, as well as um, primary or el elementary school with a large amount of education and outreach with them as well. The implementation of a successful integrated coastal zone management strategy is dependent on a strong legal and international framework. In the end, knowledge and cooperation are the keys to protecting seagrasses and other natural wonders of the Caribbean.